Now, let's uh, you know introduce the topic. Most common benign tumor from the ovarian tumor is dermoid cyst followed by serous cyst adenoma. So it is the dermoid cyst which is very common these days. And in the last class we talked about a dermoid cyst. Okay, this is usually benign. Okay, but malignant can be there. Benign is mature one. Malignant is immature one. And this dermoid cyst has a component from all three germ layer: ectodermal, endodermal, and mesodermal. This is the hallmark of dermoid cyst. Early in their course, ovarian tumors are often asymptomatic, means that lady doesn't have any symptoms and sign, no pain, okay, no abdominal distension, nothing. So uh, it may be a silent type of presentation, but later on, okay, uh, because of a massive size, she may present with a lump inside the abdominal cavity, or it may be accidentally diagnosed during pap smear examination because pap smear examination needs you know taking up that scraping isn't it with a spatula so during that time the gynecologist should definitely examine first that is called bimanual examination and any tumor any mass inside the abdomen can be palpated now another important point is it may be difficult to distinguish benign and malignant tumor sometimes because both may present in the same way, that is abnormal distension, okay, uh, then, uh, you know, uh, pain, pressure symptom, so many of them are similar, but ovarian carcinoma, by the time it manifests like that, you know, it is already metastasized, so prognosis is not that good. Now, let's move further, what are the symptoms of benign ovarian tumor? The first is pain. Pain is commonly associated with endometrioma, endometrioma, and this endometrioma is associated with endometriosis. This is not a true tumor, actually. Okay, it is ovarian mass may look like tumor. That's why it is uh, included under the list. It is unusual in uncomplicated uh, benign lesion. That means to have pain, it is not common in benign lesion. It should be so big that it should compress the nerves, then it can have pain, number one. Or it can be so big that it should have some hemorrhage inside or twisting or torsion. In that condition only, there will be pain. Otherwise, it is silent. Second important manifestation is abdominal girth, means increase in abdominal girth or size. The circumference of the abdomen increases, okay? And this is all because of the size of the tumor. Benign lesion usually enlarge slowly than the malignant one. We have studied this in pathology. There are certain differences between benign tumor and malignant tumor. One is histopathological difference. Second, size of the tumor. Third, local invasion. And fourth, distant metastasis. These four are, you know, massive important differences between benign tumor and malignant tumor. You should never forget because it can be applicable anywhere, anywhere. Okay. So according to the size of benign tumor, they enlarge slowly and malignant tumor, they enlarge quite fast or rapidly and they may become very big in no time. An enlarged abdomen may cause early satiety because of the pressure and stomach stomach size or volume is decreased and a person may feel full even after eating slight amount of food. This is called early satiety. It is also very common in carcinoma of the stomach. Now, what are the pressure effect, okay, or pressure symptom in benign ovarian tumor? A large tumor in the rectovaginal pouch, rectovaginal pouch, this is a pouch between rectum Okay, and the vagina may displace other pelvic structure upward, so distorting the urethra and producing urinary retention. Urinary retention, unable to pass urine outside. But remember, urinary bladder is full. Okay, urinary bladder is full. So, one important clinical point I like to discuss here with you 
whenever a patient come to the hospital with no passage of urine the patient says doctor for the 24 hour for the last 24 hour i have not passed urine what is the first thing you like to do yes what's the first thing what question you like to ask or what you'd like to do first anyone yes anybody so get the realization to remove the get realization yes sir okay how how do you know this is not a case of renal failure yes how do you know that you directly go for catheterization or by ultrasound sir uh -huh. we check if the bladder is full exactly so make sure bladder is full okay by either examination or investigation remember that that is a very very important point okay make sure urinary bladder is full or empty in case of renal failure urinary bladder is empty you cannot palpate it or if you do ultrasound and those type of investigation bladder is empty then uh, it cannot be a urinary retention case now it is renal failure case otherwise if urinary bladder is full if it is palpable then it is a case of urinary retention so urinary bladder examination is the first thing i like to do in clinical practice then if it is full i can easily go for catheterization if it is a case of renal failure and if i catheterize you know nothing nothing would be there right so it doesn't look good at all so this is a very common question which is asked when you go to the hospital by your senior now another type of presentation may be okay a tumor pressing down on the bladder may cause urinary frequency so urine uh, you know a urinary frequency is increased means more often the lady wants to go to the toilet it is because of the irritation and rarely very rarely ovarian tumor may cause obstructed liver as well when the lady become pregnant because of the big mass the baby cannot descend so this type of cases have been reported let's move on now some other symptoms can be rupture rupture of the mass uh, there are different types of ovarian tumor one is called serous cyst adenoma another is mucinous cyst adenoma teratoma so many other types brenner tumors and different types are there so if the rupture you know the content may leak outside in the peritoneal cavity in the pelvic cavity it may lead to peritonitis peritonitis okay in the beginning it is a chemical type of peritonitis later on it may be bacterial peritonitis some of the endocrine effects may be there but those endocrine effects are very common in malignant tumor than the benign one more common in malignant tumor so they are relatively uncommon here uh, and so the examples are endometrioma and lutein cyst may cause menstrual irregularity now, i want to repeat them again these are not true tumor okay these are not true true tumor endometrioma means chocolate cyst which is associated with endometrial tissue in ovary and lutein cyst from the corpus luteum sex cord stromal tumor may be strogenic androgenic or virilizing now these are the real hormone producing tumor because uh, you know uh, they uh, may be granulosa cell tumor they may be thicka cell tumor isn't it or they may be sex okay called sortoli or lydic cell tumor sortoli or lydic cell granulosa cell tumor commonly produce estrogen sometimes granulosa and thicka cell tumor occur together so they are estrogenic whereas a uh, sortoli lydic cell tumor are usually androgenic in nature androgenic are also known as virilizing this is a important term in clinical practice virilizing means that lady develops a lot of male like feature okay other possible presentation include infarction hemorrhage or torsion these are also included under uh, complication also included under complication now let's move on
Now, what are the signs during physical examination? What we get? See that benign lesions are usually smooth walled, cystic, and freely mobile. So these are the hallmarks of benign tumor. They have got capsule, so that capsule make them smooth walled. They they are quite cystic during examination. Now cystic is a fluid filled mass, so a uh, fluctuation test is positive in case of cystic mass. But these are quite deep inside the you know abdominal cavity, so we cannot you know do all those uh, type of tests you know because they are present in the pelvic cavity or abdominal cavity. When small, they may be felt within the pelvic cavity by bimanual examination. When large tumor is palpable abdominally because they are quite big, they have come above the pelvic cavity and freely palpable. They are frequently unilateral than the bilateral, but bilateral tumor may exist. Now, one important point is though they are freely mobile, sometimes they may adhere to an adjacent structure because of infection. Infection or inflammation can lead to adhesion formation, and that can lead to you know immobility of the tumor. And sometimes it is really big, really big. It is filling the whole abdominal or pelvic cavity. It is again immobile because there is no space to move. So remember, regarding the mobility, malignant tumors are usually immobile, and benign tumors are usually mobile. But there are certain exception in benign tumor where it can be immobile. Now, some other uh, you know signs may be benign cystic teratoma may feel doughy due to their sebaceous content. This is called doughy feeling. Now, dough you all know because all of you love roti or, or chapati, isn't it? So when you are about to make that roti or chapati, remember how you you know mix that flour with with water? Exactly, uh, you know that type of feeling is called doughy feeling, or that is called dough. So because of the sebaceous content, when we feel this benign cystic teratoma, okay, or dermoid cyst, you can say they can feel doughy as well. So this is one of the point here. Now that this doughy feeling. Is also present in abdominal tuberculosis, especially the peritoneal type of abdominal tuberculosis. It can be asked as an MCQ question in the exam, okay? Doughy feeling of the abdomen. If we do abdominal percussion, what we get? It usually demonstrates dullness anteriorly with resonance in the flank as the bowel is displaced laterally. So, usually, you know. The, uh, the ovarian tumor presents like this. It presents right at the center of the abdomen. Center. That means uh, the, the intestine are displaced laterally. Okay. Now, when we are doing abdominal percussion, because the cyst or the tumor is present at the central part of the abdomen, it, it felt like a dull mass there. But when we reach the flank, flank means on the side, okay, we, we, we felt it resonant. Now, why, why bowel is felt resonant? What is the reason? Yes, what is the reason? Because of sir, gas and the bowel. Because president, the flood will surface. Exactly. It's a gas, you can say. You can say easily, it's a gas present in the bowel. Because bowel usually contains gas. The gas uh, which we swallowed during eating, that gas. And when we breathe, you know, half of the air will go to our GI tract. So that gas is always there. As a result of that, when we percuss over the bowel, uh, you know, it felt resonant. Never forget this. Shifting dullness may occur due to ascites, which may only occur with some fibroma. Now, in the last class, I clearly talked about MIG syndrome. Now, tell me, what is MIG syndrome? Yes. What are the three components of mixed syndrome? It's a combination, sir, it's a combination of fibroma with ascites and hydrothrax. Excellent. Fibroma, very good. Ascites, okay, and hydrothorax. Hydrothorax means plural effusion. It's absolutely right. Plural effusion. Especially 
on the right side. Okay, this is called Meek syndrome. Very important question in the exam. So because of this ascites, shifting dullness is positive in case of fibroma. And fibroma are not that big, huge type of tumor. So I can easily do the shifting dullness test. Now, what investigation we like to do to confirm the diagnosis, okay? These are the clinical examination we have done. Now, it's a time for investigation. Routine, hematological, and biological study has to be done all the time just to rule out whether this is a malignant tumor or benign tumor, to rule out whether there is any complication like infection or not. So all, all those tests like CBC, okay? Uh, total count, differential count, ESR, then liver function test, renal function test, electrolytes, everything has to be done. Another important test is abdominal X-ray or abdominal radiograph that can show calcification, especially in case of dermoid cyst or benign cystic teratoma. And this is the most common neoplasm in younger age. Calcification can be seen. Now, this type of calcifications are called dystrophic type of calcification, okay? Another one, pelvic ultrasound, very routine type of investigation, always do that. Now, there are two ways by which pelvic ultrasound is done. One is called transabdominal, another is called transvaginal. And transvaginal is much more better than transabdominal because sensitivity of this is much higher. Ascitic fluid cytology can be done if there is ascites. We can simply, you know, uh, draw the fluid from the peritoneal cavity and send to the lab. They will give us the report. We especially want to see whether there are some malignant cells present or not. Okay, just to rule out malignant tumor. Not, it, it is not seen all the time, even if it is a malignant tumor, okay? Only in stage three, the malignant cells are present in the ascitic fluid, even in ovarian cancer. Now, there are certain tumor marker, okay? There are certain tumor marker, and if they are elevated, we can, you know, think about ovarian cancer. So just to rule out or exclude ovarian cancer, we can go for some tumor marker test, like, okay, CA125, carcinoma antigen 125 is elevated, in 80% of the patient with advanced ovarian cancer. So this is important data for us. So this is one of the important tumor marker which we do all the time in this type of case. But this is not specific. Other uh, cancer can also have elevation of CA125. But remember, uh, this is not the only test we do, isn't it? We combine so many things together. If there is a mass in the pelvic cavity, if there is ascites, Okay, if there are some general features of malignancy, and along with that, if CH125 is elevated, then all these clues, if you combine together, then the puzzle will be solved. Okay, just one, one clue is not enough. Now, what is the treatment of benign ovarian tumor? A high index of suspicion for possible malignancy is necessary. Now, they may present in the same way in the beginning. Remember that because we clearly, you know, discuss in the beginning of this class, sometimes benign tumor and malignant tumor are difficult to differentiate. Okay. They may manifest in the same way. So high index of suspicion for possible malignancy necessary. What does that mean? Think about this tumor as a malignant tumor until proven otherwise. Benign tumor will not kill her, but malignant tumor would definitely kill her. So this is the point. If there is any doubt as to whether the tumor is malignant, the whole ovary should be removed and a frozen section of the tumor is examined histopathologically with a view to proceeding surgically for carcinoma. Now, this type of concept I've already explained to you. Remember the importance of frozen section biopsy here. This is very commonly done in the operation theater. The surgeon has opened it, you know, open the abdomen or open any other site, for example. They are in doubt. They thought in the beginning, this may be a benign tumor, but when they open the abdomen, 
they thought it can be a malignant tumor. Now they want to confirm it. So what they do, they take some of the tissue or remove the whole organ if possible. And they call pathologists right there. Pathologist will do frozen section histopathology. It takes just few minutes time. Remember that it can be done very quickly. The surgeon will wait, wait for the report and then he or she may proceed accordingly. If it is malignant tumor, what should be done now? What is the different surgery in malignant tumor than benign tumor? Anybody? Yes? Sir, complete removal of that part in which there is malignant uh, tumor. It's right? invasive. Like I said, it's invasive type of surgery. Like I said, we also like remove the neighboring parts. So, uh, so sir, if there's any type of spread, that can be also removed, basically. Exactly. Both of them are right. This is a bigger surgery. In benign tumor, we just remove the mass, you know, that's enough. But in malignant tumor, we include some, some adjoining area, okay? We include lymph node. Remember that lymph nodes are the very important thing which must be removed, the, the draining lymph nodes. And uh, some other, you know, adjoining organ also can be sacrificed sometimes. One of the example I want to give here, uh, like total abdominal hysterectomy, with bilateral salpingo oophorectomy. Now see that one-sided, you know, ovary is having problem. You sacrifice the whole thing there. So this is a massive surgery. This is usually done in malignant type of tumor. But in benign tumor, uh, you know, we don't need to do that. Cystectomy is an important type of, you know, surgery which we do here. See this cystectomy enucleation of the cyst from the ovary. So you just remove the cyst only. You don't remove the whole ovary there. So if possible, that can be done. It is usually performed in young patient if future fertility is required and the tumor appears benign. You should be absolutely sure the tumor is benign first. And according to her age, according to her consent, you know, we go for this type of surgery. But if you are in doubt, this type of surgery is lethal to her. You cannot preserve any tissue there. Whereas in postmenopausal woman, okay, the, the, the uh, menopause has already happened. They have already completed the family. You don't need to preserve anything. So total abdominal hysterectomy and bilateral salping oophorectomy are appropriate type of therapy. But again, please let me clarify this. It is, it is her consent which is important. Some of the lady, they still want to preserve their uterus, even if it is a benign tumor. Okay. In malignant tumor, there is no doubt we'll remove everything. But in benign tumor, uh, okay, uh, we need to explain the situation to her and then do accordingly. Now, what are the indications for surgery? See there. These are the important indications for surgery. Any solid ovarian lesion. The solid ovarian lesion has higher chance of progression into malignancy. Any ovarian lesion with papillary vegetation on the cyst wall. This may be okay, serous cyst adenocarcinoma. And this papillary vegetation you know, may, may quickly transform into malignant form. Any adnexal mass which is more than 10 centimeter, that's a big one. It has more chance of complication. Palpable adnexal mass in a premenarchal or postmenopausal woman, again, chance of malignancy is higher. Premenarchal, before the age of menarche, postmenopausal, after the menopause. Any adnexal mass, in the last class we discussed about the adnexal mass, there can be differential diagnosis, you know. So, we strongly think there can be malignant mass. Because of that is time. The timing is important here. Premenarchal or postmenopausal, higher chance of malignancy. And then any torsion or rupture suspected, you, you don't treat it medically. Surgical treatment is immediately required. Now, this is a summary. Okay, of the management, which we have talked till now. For example, there is ovarian mass in reproductive age group. See there. We'll do, okay, ultrasound, and we detect the size. 
if it is less than 5 cm detected by ultrasound or equal or more than 5 cm detected by ultrasound. And ultrasound will also tell us whether it is a cystic mass or it's a solid mass, okay? Or a complex means mixed with cystic and solid. Now, if it is purely cystic, and if the size is less than five centimeter, high chance of benign tumor. So we can observe it, you know, we can observe it. And then uh, the same management is, okay, followed up. Or within, within the period of time, if this tumor is rapidly increasing in size, rapidly increasing in size, or if it is, doesn't decrease. Uh, for example, you have followed it for a few years, the tumor is still there, so it's still less than five centimeter, but it is still there. Then we can go for surgery, but you don't need to go for immediate surgery here. Whereas if the tumor is more than or equal to five centimeter and if it looks suspicious, you quickly arrange for surgery because there is a high chance of malignancy. So this is a very good concept you have. So what is the take home messages from here? Benign ovarian tumors are quite common. You don't need to panic explain the situation to the patient, okay, and plan accordingly. And this is a very good algorithm or guideline. Now, what are the complications? One of the important complications of uh, ovarian tumor is torsion, okay, torsion. Now, what is torsion, by the way? Yes, let me ask this before we move further. What is torsion? The twisting type of twisting. Exactly. Very good. So in one word, you have answered and you are absolutely correct. Twisting. Exactly. Ovarian tumor usually have got stock. Now, when there is a twisting of that stock, there's a blood vessel passing through it. So there's a high chance of ischemia development. That condition is known as torsion. So most commonly, it happens with dermoid cyst and fibroma but may occur with any mobile tumor of any size. Even a smaller size tumor can develop torsion and large size tumor can also develop torsion. When the tumor is absolutely large and it is not mobile, you know, there's no chance of torsion because for the torsion, it, it has to twist there. Torsion always produces severe lower abdominal pain, often originating in the iliac fossa, and radiating to the flank. And this is called reverse renal colic. This is a very important you know, sentence here. Now, let me explain it in other way. In case of kidney stone, or in case of renal colic, or ureteric colic, pain always starts in the loin, and it moves towards the groin. It is known as loin to groin pain. Now, loin means lumbar area. Okay, groin means it is in the iliac region, isn't it? We all know that, okay, there are some lymph nodes present there. It's a genital area, you can say. So in this case of ovarian torsion, the pain is moving from the, you know, iliac region or the, you know, groin area upwards. It is because of the mass, which is originating downward and going upward. That's the reason. Nausea and vomiting are quite common here because this is a very painful situation. There may be a history of similar episodes representing partial twisting and untwisting of the pedicle sometimes. If patient is lucky, it may just start the process and then reverse on its own. Means it has not completely twisted. The mass may be extremely tender during palpation. And if we do not treat, the mass soon become necrotic. Along with the mass, you know, the rest of the ovary can also be necrotic sometimes if it is a part of the mass. Regarding the differential diagnosis of this torsion of the ovarian cyst, ectopic pregnancy is one of the important, you know, differential diagnosis, acute appendicitis, and diverticulitis because of the pain which the patient is suffering and because of the sight. Now, ectopic pregnancy is a real surgical emergency, okay, real surgical emergency. Once we suspect, we need to open the abdominal cavity and remove that, that mass. Otherwise, there is high chance of death of that lady because of rupture of ectopic pregnancy and because of hemorrhagic shock. 
acute appendicitis we already talked about if pain is on the right side okay right iliac fossa then acute appendicitis can be suspected diverticulitis is mainly present on the left side left iliac fossa because sigmoid colon is the most common organ now some other uh, complication can be rupture okay, spontaneous rupture see here this rupture occurs rarely usually from internal hemorrhage or intracystic pressure unless the cyst is small rupture is painful and accompanied by vomiting and various degrees of shock the lady can bleed a lot because of rupture it depends on how much hemorrhage has occurred inside the peritoneal cavity so various degrees of shock can occur and this is again hypovolemic or hemorrhagic type of shock severe peritoneal irritation can occur okay and whenever the blood is present in the peritoneal cavity later on it will lead to adhesion formation and remember this adhesion can lead to intestinal obstruction later on these are important cause of intestinal obstruction later on so important you know history to ask in that lady if she presents with intestinal obstruction later on that time she may have pain she may have abdominal distension she may she must have been admitted in the hospital she must have done surgery okay those type of history are important here now once again see this mucinous cyst adenoma has a lot of mucinous material inside and they are quite a big size tumor so there is a high chance of rupture and when they rupture they lead to pseudo myxoma peritonei pseudo myxoma peritonei that can be a important term here less common this complication can occur like hemorrhage into a cyst which produce pain and infection can occur but infection is uh, not that common uh, in case of ovarian cyst but it can happen as a result of spread of infection after abortion or even delivery abortion or delivery that infection must have passed upward from the vagina into the endometrial cavity first and from endometrial cavity it has passed into the fallopian tube and then reached towards the ovary because it, there is a track there you know so the microorganism can go like that but that is quite rare 